Information from a new tranche of leaked documents about secretive offshore firms has been published by a consortium of outlets, including The Guardian and the BBC. Following the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, this leak is branded the Pandora Papers. Prominent figures in the documents include Tony and Cherie Blair. From the leak, we've learned that the Blairs saved £300,000 in tax when they purchased a London townhouse costing £6.4 million from a Bahraini minister. The Blairs were able to avoid paying the tax because instead of buying the house and paying the relevant stamp duty, they bought the holding company which owned the house. That holding company had been owned by the Bahraini Minister for Industry. It's based in the British Virgin Islands. The Guardian report... While there was nothing illegal about the transaction and there is no evidence the Blairs proactively sought to avoid stamp duty, the deal highlights a loophole that has enabled wealthy property owners not to pay a tax that is commonplace for many ordinary property buyers in the UK. The Guardian are quite clear it wasn't the Blairs' idea to arrange the purchase so as to avoid stamp duty and Sherry Blair has claimed she had no knowledge of the building's owners and that this financial vehicle was the only way to purchase it. One might ask, though, if you were a former prime minister or their partner, they bought it together, and the property you want is being sold via a tax-avoiding scheme and from a mysterious owner, maybe you just shouldn't buy it. There are no surprises when it comes to Tony Blair, are they? H- however low he goes, it's, it, I just take it as a given now. It's like Berlusconi or something. I mean, look, it really does stretch the boundaries of plausibility to claim that you had no idea that the multi-million pound building that you were buying for your strategy company uh, was being, you know, sold by a Bahraini minister through a, you know, British Virgin Islands tax haven thing, right? Who, who, Who goes, oh, I had no idea. I was just flashing out the cash. I had no idea who was selling it. Right. That's, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I refuse to believe that. That either means that Cherie Blair is exceptionally stupid or that she thinks that we are exceptionally stupid, right? It's one of the two. Um, as for this idea about, you know, public uh, service and politicians, we start the show really by talking about the conflict between labor and capital. We're talking about labor in terms of the workforce. Uh, people who uh, actually create value versus those who are able to expropriate it from workers. Um, Now, in a different way, we're talking about the conflict between labor and capital and the role of the Labour Party within it. So the only Labour leader who's been able to win elections in the past 40 years is the one who purchased a multi-million pound building via an offshore tax haven. I think that tells you an awful lot about the kind of ideological compromises made by the Labour Party in order to be seen as electable. Tony Blair is and always was an integral part of the establishment, drenched in the culture of the establishment and drenched in the financial practices and values of the establishment. He is not someone who stood up for Labour in that conflict between labor and capital, what he was was an agent of capital um, acceding to a few demands from labor in order to make sure that the elite could carry on extracting value, dodging uh, tax by exploiting loopholes, getting richer at the expense of everybody else. And he continued to do that just at a more accelerated pace when he left office. Mm. I mean, my favorite fact about Tony Blair, or I think the one that is most telling about how politics works in this country is he's literally the godfather to Rupert Murdoch's child, right? So people are sort of like, oh, no, no, the, you know, the son only backed, the, the new Labourites will tell you, the son only backed new Labour because they were already on a winning streak. It wasn't that, that Tony Blair made some sinister compromise, some sinister deal with Rupert Murdoch. He literally was the godfather to his son. You know, you cannot get closer than that. It's, it's grotesque. We're going to move on to another story from the Pandora Papers. This one concerns the Conservatives and a leading Tory donor. Mohammed Amersi has given nearly £525,000 to the party since 2018. And he also, according to the leaked papers, had a key role negotiating what US authorities have called a $220 million bribe. At the time, Amersi was providing services to the boss of Telia, 
a Swedish telecom company who was seeking business in Uzbekistan. He negotiated the multi-million pound payment to the daughter of Uzbekistan's then president. It's a fairly complicated story, but this BBC graphic summarizes Amersi's work for Telia quite well. So as you can see here, the starting point for this story is as a Swedish company, Telia, they wanted more business in Uzbekistan. That means they have to get the government of Uzbekistan on side. Coincidentally or otherwise, Telia gives shares in its Uzbek subsidiary to Gulnara Karimova, who is the daughter of the then Uzbek president. Her involvement is hidden behind an offshore company. Obviously, the daughter of the president doesn't really want the shares. She wants some cash. So Telia then offered to buy back most of Karimova's shares. And this is where Mohammed Amersi comes in. He handles negotiations with the offshore company. And the evidence here is an email from Telia's boss to Amersi. I do not want to be involved on day-to-day -day negotiations, so maybe you can handle it. Mohammed Amersi, sure, I agree. After that, so negotiated by Amersi, Telia pays Karamova's company $220 million. The US Department of Justice calls it a £220 million bribe payment. And we should say, Mr. Amersi's lawyers say the offshore company had been vetted and approved by Telia. Vetted and approved for what, I suppose, is the question. Vetted and approved as being close in relations to the Uzbek president so that that would help them get contracts in the country. A lot to say about this story. One of the things for me is that, you know, when people say politics in this country is sort of all tied up with these really dodgy, corrupt Russian or otherwise oligarchs, there was another story today about one of the Russian ones. It just makes like this country seem kind of pathetic because the numbers are so small, you know, like 500... <laughs> It is all you need to sort of get the government to be on your side. Because, you know, people say, oh, we need to clamp down on tax avoiders. If one of the conservatives' main sources of income is all of these people involved in, in tax avoidance, that clearly is going to significantly affect their ability to, to clamp down on it. At the same time, could we not just agree that, you know, we could, if we publicly funded political parties, all you've got to replace is a few million quid, right? It's like 0.00%. Or 0.001% or whatever of, of, of government spending. And then we could be free from all of these terrible oligarchs. Why don't we just why don't we just do that? Well, look, I mean, political parties aren't hugely expensive operations in this country, particularly when you compare it to, you know, other organizations, right? They're relatively cheap. So you can buy influence if you're an oligarch, and you can buy your way out of uh, your tax obligations or the rules which would apply to everybody else for a remarkably small sum of money. So I was quite struck by the Richard Desmond, Robert Jenrick thing, where Richard Desmond got a property development approved within a time frame, which meant that he skipped out on having to pay, pay quite a big uh, a sum in tax to Tower Hamlets Council. Tower Hamlets, where 55% of children are in poverty. Uh, Robert Jenrick helped expedite this uh, property deal, and it meant that he dodged having to pay millions in tax. The amount which was donated to the Conservative Party was £12,000. So it's £12,000 which avoids you multiple like millions, tens of millions in tax. £12,000 is nothing. It's an absolute bargain. So you're right. These sums of money are really small. The thing that struck me though, particularly when you were uh, going through uh, the sequencing of this bribe was the role of family. And it kind of made me think about, you know, uh, Tony Blair being godfather to Rupert Murdoch's son. And then you've got this element here of the role of the Uzbek president's daughter is that the establishment really do run themselves like a mafia like a criminal gang. The structures and the hierarchies are the same. It might be on the right side of the law, and trust me, that's a technicality rather than a moral value, but the sort of networks of patronage, the role of family, the concentration of wealth, power, and influence within blood ties, it's got mafia written all over it. The difference is, is that it's legal. That's it. And, and, and that tells you something about how vast this power is rather than whether or not it is moral, whether or not it's good for people, whether or not it's good for society, democracy, the public at large.